Hello everyone, I am here with a woman who doesn't even need an introduction anymore. Everyone knows who she is now. She ran against Joe Manchin in West Virginia in the 2018 congressional race. And now she's back. She's running for the Senate again, this time against Shelley Moore Capito. Her name is Paula Jean Swearingen. Paula, thank you so much for coming back. Hey, Mike, and that's Shelly Moore Capito, actually. Capito. I've been pronouncing that wrong Capito. forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody mispronounces my name, too, so it's okay. It, same as well. Figueredo is not the easiest thing to pronounce. There's too many vowels. So, you know, we, we just, we band together these people who have their names mispronounced, and we, we just, we correct the record. So thank you for coming here. Everyone thank at this point, we all know who you are. We all love you. And the minute you got back into the race, like you hinted at this when you were on my show when we talked about mm -hmm. the knock down the house documentary but now it's official now you've announced and this time i mean i had a good feeling about you last time of course mm -hmm. because you're so real you're genuine but this time it feels really different i believe you're the only democrat running in the primary currently right so you're kind so of far. the front runner so, mm -hmm. so what's different this time now that you're not running against mansion you're running against capito well, Capito and Jim, Joe Manchin are kind of the same people, except one's Democrat and one's Republican. I just don't think Shelley Moore Capito's got enough scrutiny. She she votes straight Republican. She votes against our health care. She's not a really good advocate for West Virginia, and they're really good friends. But um, I really believe that if we're going to elect somebody like Bernie Sanders, we need support in the Senate. We have some good progressive candidates in the House, We uh, good incumbents in the House. And we have some candidate, you know, good progressive candidates for the House, but we definitely need more support in the Senate. That's why I made this decision. But also, when I came back home after the last campaign, coming back home and still seeing the poverty, still seeing the addiction epidemic, still having to worry if my children are going to get cancer, I think that, you know, I, I already knew I was going to do it, even though I knew it was so hard, but I found out I'm expecting my first grandbaby. Wow, congratulations. And, um, you know, my fire was already there, but that amplified my fire like 3,000 times because I I can't stand the thought of my grandchild being born into West Virginia and me having to worry about my grandchild now getting cancer. So, you know, it did just sealed the deal, you know, and we have some wonderful progressive candidates running across the state. There's actually a wonderful progressive um, uh, candidate for governor. I want to give a shout out to him. His name is Stephen Smith. He's doing something that's unconventional and what we've been doing with brand new congress um it's not like he's running a slate of candidates anybody can sign on to the pledge democrat republican independent libertarian but what he's doing is with this pledge um candidates are swearing off corporate and corporate pack dollars they have to face the debate no matter what because we had not only you know joe manchin not facing me last time for a debate where we had some other congressional candidates and their incumbents would not, you know, their, the incumbents wouldn't face them for a debate. And you have to meet with the, your constituents at least 25 times before the primary. So people, they have to pledge that they're going to get out for people to know them. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, so we're, we've seen the movement grow with the teacher strike. The movement grew after, um, you know, my run, I, you know, it's not me tooting my horn because there's all the candidates with brand new Congress and Justice Democrats and people running across the country. We actually had a couple great progressives get elected in the Capitol last year, but it's amazing to see West Virginians step up. And we have so many running for office, and most of them are signing that pledge. They're not taking corporate and corporate PAC dollars. I hope other states start doing that. It doesn't matter if you agree on politics, but at least people can get to know you. And if you are going to be a public servant, at least you're taking that first step to not take that dark money. So that means a lot. I totally agree with that. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the teacher's strike because I feel like, you know, starting with you, we really saw, at least for me, like I'm on the opposite side, you know, of the country, West Virginia just rise, you know, and mm -hmm. now this is really such a huge state. There's so much progressive activism, activism coming out. And you all are incredibly effective. And the interesting thing about this race is I have to think that Capito is horrified right now because in 2016, you've brought this up, Bernie Sanders won all 55 counties in West he Virginia. Did. So and in he the still event, got a lot of support. He still has a ton of support on the ground. So in the event you go up against Capito, we're looking at a really great shot. Like, you can pull this off. So tell me about the response you've gotten on the ground. I know you just launched, 
But there's got to be energy, you know, given the history of West Virginia, how fired up and mobilized everyone is currently. Is there a lot more optimism now? Because it's it's difficult to be optimistic when nationally speaking, you know, we're all feeling more cynical. But mm -hmm. what is the sense that you get from people in West Virginia with regard to your new um, race here? So many people are signing up. My campaign manager is almost, actually almost panicking because we've got thousands of volunteers already signed up. It is a challenge right now with with money because, you know, grassroots campaigns, you know, Shelly Moore Capito, before I even got started, she got over two million in her bank account, in her campaign account. And so, you know, we've done a soft launch with, you know, within less than 30 days. You know, we've, we're on average, we're hitting over twenty thousand twenty thousand dollars And, you know, we've got a lot of progressive candidates. Bernie's running now, not taking corporate and corporate PAC dollars. But we do need support behind Bernie. We need support in Congress and Senate. That's one of the determining factors, like I said, that I decided to do this because we need support in the Senate. You know, that's my hardest thing to do is to ask for money. But in order to go against Shelley Moore Capito, there's going to be two things that we need. One is money and one we need to get on Shelley Moore Capito to sign that West Virginia Can't Wait pledge and make sure she signs, if she wants to go woman to woman, let's go. And she needs to get rid of the dark money and face me. You kind of were known before you started running for Congress as that one activist who was yelling at Joe Manchin, you know, in these town mm -hmm. halls. So that's why I say, you know, Capitol's got to be horrified right now because now you're not just, you know, one of these dozen or so candidates running for Congress. Now mm -hmm. you've ran before. Uh, I believe Bernie Sanders endorsed you. Um, well, I've, endo I've endorsed Bernie Sanders. You've endorsed Bernie. And, that's um, we're talking about me being a surrogate for the campaign, me and Corey Bush and Amy Vela, you know, we're from Knock Down the House. We as the three of us went ahead and endorsed Bernie. Um, but yeah, we're always going to be behind that's him. That's great. I will, you know, my years of activism, you know, I just, let me tell a story about Bernie for a minute. Um, you know, I went through all the, all these years fighting for my kids, fighting for my state. It felt like our incumbents wasn't listening. When I first seen Bernie Sanders, he was coming up for a rally in Charleston. And he stopped at a food bank in McDowell County, one of the poorest counties in the state. Didn't photo op. He just showed up. It, it amazed me that he cared that much. And then he, when he gave his speech, he talked about our struggles. He talked about stuff our incumbents weren't even talking about. And I felt desperate as an activist. And he was holding a town hall in McDowell County. And um, they were, you know, a long story short, I was supposed to maybe possibly speak on a panel. Somebody had reached out to me and I didn't get to speak on a panel. But I thought, I'm not leaving here unless I talk to Bernie Sanders. So I walked up to him. I introduced myself. I, and I asked him for two minutes of his time. I followed him all the way from the back of the room to the front of the room, him talking to media, signing autographs. And little Bernie Sanders just threw his hands up and he said, wait a minute. I told this woman I'd talk to her. He, I was sold. I sat down and talked to him, cried all over Bernie Sanders, felt like I was talking to Grandpa, telling him what my gra my brothers did yesterday. He didn't overpromise. His cam you know, his cam his his team has reached out to West Virginia for years. He keeps showing up. He keeps on showing up in food banks. He shows up in the front lines. When he comes to West Virginia, he doesn't just come to photo op, speak at a rally. He gets right there in the nuts and bolts in West Virginia. I will always stand behind Bernie Sanders. And the biggest reason why is because I know he's genuine and I know he cares. Never in my lifetime, out of all my years in activism, was I treated with that much respect from an incumbent. And he's all the way in Vermont. He cared more than than our, our leaders here in West Virginia. And if I'm thinking of the correct moment, this was on video as well. There was no audio, yeah. it was just you and Bernie sharing that moment. And this was, I think, my first um, introduction to you where I just thought, this is really touching. Like, there, there's no audio. This is clearly not being done for a photo well, There walk. actually was audio, but him and I didn't mm. even know we were being recorded. Somebody oh, recorded it and they put it online and it ended up going viral, which he deserved yeah. that recognition. But yeah, yeah he... Um, yeah, we, we, we thought we were just sitting down with a private conversation. Yeah, and, and you could tell that you guys weren't aware of that because this was just a really, you know, a human moment where, you know, you mm -hmm. were communicating the issues of West Virginia and he was listening, which we don't see. Like, we need we need people to listen. You know, there's, there's a lot of politicians that love to hear the sound of their own voice and love to talk. But the point, and I think what a lot of new politicians are doing is they're listening. And that's so mm -hmm. important because people need to be listened to, especially in a state like West Virginia that has had the same leadership for years and they have been largely forgotten. And th that's kind of one thing I wanted to talk to you about because 
Donald Trump, he basically, he came in in 2016 saying, we're going to bring back coal and whatnot. And so there's this idea, and I know that you know it's wrong and I know it's wrong, that, oh, well, how can a liberal or a progressive or a leftist win back West Virginia when Trump is talking about, you know, the coal miners and he's going to bring back coal? But um, how do you respond to that? Because I know that that's probably going to come up in terms of like how you specifically address the concerns of coal miners. Well, first of all, I think the biggest lie that a politician can tell is the market for coal for coal is going to rebound because it's not. It's been declining way back since the 70s. We have needed to look at a you know a broader economic structure for decades, and our incomes have not been doing it because all they've thought about is coal, 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 and lying in their pocketbooks. Um, gas is coming in, but the thing about it is they're not they're not making them be responsible environmentally. They're not giving back to our communities like the coal industry did. And we don't have visionaries for economic outlook. And, you know, the possibilities here are endless. If we would legalize cannabis, create a model like Colorado, we would see economic growth within six to eight months. Um, if we, ha we could have hemp, we could have renewables. I mean, growing hemp on mountaintop removal sites, I mean, they're not fit for a rattlesnake, but that's one thing that's viable on mountaintop removal sites. That's something we can do to, you know, to fix the damage. Um, if we have good roads, we have good schools, we have expensive broadband, you know, we're going to invite other business here. We just need people that are visionaries for our future and growth instead of being visionaries in their demise. Because we, you know, let's face it, that's what we've been dealing with for a long time. Everybody thinks we're so divided in West Virginia. I think we've already showed we're not, you know, we're not going to forget our labor struggles, labor struggles. And that, carried forward with the teachers movement. Um, but we're, we're tired. We're tired of corrupt politicians. We've not had any choices. That's why I stood up. And you've seen so many people stand up across the country, but especially in West Virginia, because this is one of the poorest and sickest states in the nation. You know, Medicare for all people don't realize the majority of the, the health care provided in this state is Medicare and Medicaid. And small businesses are struggling under the ACA because they can't afford to pay their, their workers a living wage because the economy is so bad and they can't afford high premiums for health care. Medicare for all would be the best thing to ever happen to West Virginia. Not only would we see, you know, people would be healthier. Um, not only does it, it, does it make moral sense, but it makes economic sense. If you have happy, healthy people, they're more productive parts of society. And with the addiction epidemic, um, I learned a lot my last campaign, actually, about the addiction epidemic here. We lead in overdoses in America right now. And what's happening is, you know, drug replacement therapy, which is vital for some people, but that's the only that's the only vision that our leaders have to solve the problem, and it's not working. We have a lot of people in the front lines of our communities work, working on peer peer-led long-term recovery systems. We should have a long-term recovery center on every corner of this state. Not only should we quit shipping the pills in here, and, you know, in the amounts that we have, go against big pharma, but we have to make sure that people have a path to recovery and we don't have that right now. And the little that we do, we do have, they don't, they're not funded, they're not supported by medical providers, so, social workers. So, it, you know, it's, you know it's, it's there, but it's not enough. And what our leaders should be doing is what, like I did the last campaign, I know what's going on in the coal fields. I wanted to know what was going on in the central part of the state, the northern panhandle, panhandle, the eastern panhandle. How can we be good leaders if we're not setting, with, setting down with people that are working in the front lines of our communities that are solving our problems because our leaders aren't and learning how to, how to be voices for the people if we don't learn from, and grow. And that's what, they're not doing that. There's, Again, and I say it over and over, they're lying in their pockets and they're not solving the problems. And we're tired of being collateral damage. I mean, it's all these, all these problems, the poverty, um, the environment, the addiction epidemic, they're all systemic issues and they all go back to the same thing and it's corruption. And I love how when you talk about the issues in West Virginia, you address the issues, but you also talk about the solutions as well. And I just I don't see that. And it's not just West Virginia, of course, because corruption mm -hmm. is a national problem. But when you think about, for example, Joe Manchin, he's career minded. I mean, I, I read um, the Reddit AMA that you did, and this is now outdated news. But Joe Manchin was considering a run for governor in West Virginia mm -hmm. after he just fought so hard to keep that seat. And, you know, to kind of paraphrase your response was this is kind of like a slap in the face after he 
had ran so difficult, you know, against me, and now he's thinking about being governor, and he ended up not choosing to run, but it's just a matter of, like, do you care about fixing these issues currently, or do you care about your own career? And it's evident that people, they make political calculations because of their career, and overall, they're not looking out for the issues. Like, I don't believe someone like Shelley Moore Capito or Joe Manchin would put their necks on the line for West Virginia if that meant that they would lose their career over a particular vote. And that's really what differentiates you and candidates like you from all of these other entrenched establishment politicians. Like, you're in this for the people, and they are not. And that's... That's one reason why, and I always talk about cynicism, but it, there really is a need to feel optimistic because, you know, now 2020 is a different game. Like there mm -hmm. was, what, 50, um, well, maybe not 50, but there was a lot of candidates running in 2018, which was quadruple the amount in 2016. Mm -hmm. Now in 2020, there's, it's impossible for me to keep track of all the candidates running. So it's, it's so mm -hmm. nice that, one, all these new candidates are popping up, but two, the candidates who we've kind of grown to love and followed like you are back um and i just i find it so inspiring so i wanted to ask you about the um the race and the dynamics of your race because we all saw like i think you and i we both know the story of amy valela in nevada's mm -hmm. fourth congressional district where she was essentially the de facto front runner after reuben kewin announced that he wasn't going to be running so she it looked like she was going to be the winner um, but what happened was the establishment had recruited someone to run against her. Now, I wanted yeah. to ask you about this because you're the de facto front runner. You know, you are running in a wide open primary and you're the only one. So do you foresee a situation where the establishment, if they think this candidate maybe is a little bit too radical for us, maybe she is speaking out too much against our donors. Do you foresee them recruiting someone to run against you or do you think that they are just not even going to look at this because they think that Capito is going to win. I'm surprised they haven't already. And I've heard rumors that they would. Mm -hmm. um, and if they do, you know, we'll just do like we always did. We made history in my last campaign. We got more votes against the sitting incumbent in 75 years. And I got more votes than any Republican on the ballot. So we show how weak the establishment is with the teacher strike and everything that's going on here in West Virginia. Other candidates, run, run, you know, running and not taking corporate PAC dollars and corporate dollars. Um, I, I, I think we're going to win or lose, though. I have to be I have to be transparent. It's not only about winning. Last time, not only did we change the conversation nationally, but internationally and we put shame on dark money all over the world. And so win or lose, if we, if, if we keep on running candidates and we keep on using our voices and we keep on holding them accountable, then they're going to have to be accountable. We've proven that they're not going to get by with what they've been doing anymore. So, yeah, let them send somebody after me. Win or lose, you know, Paula Jean ain't going to shut up. And I, I haven't, you know, even even after I lost. And West Virginia's not going to shut up. And people across the country is not going to shut up. And even if Bernie loses, he's not going to shut up. Their they're accountability's here. It's now. They either jump on board or we're taking over. That's just the whole narrative, and it's not going to change. And that's such a great sentiment to have. Like, we are constantly keeping the pressure on them because we all know, like, the minute we relieve some of that pressure, they're going to go back to their same old tricks because mm -hmm. we have institutions that have been corrupted by money. And right. that force, like, it, it's so corrosive that we can't afford to kind of look away, especially now when we all kind of feel as if, you know, we have 10 years to act when it comes to climate change. There's, mm -hmm. you know, a healthcare crisis in this country where people are going bankrupt and they're dying because they don't have health insurance or maybe they do, mm -hmm. but they can't afford their deductible. So we don't have a choice. And I think that that's really the main thing that everyone who's running for Congress is saying. I stepped up because I have no choice. We don't have a, mm -hmm. a choice. Just like you said, you know, it's your children. You don't want them to get cancer. And now you have a grandchild on the way. So it's a matter of we have to act because sitting by and remaining complicit as everything just goes down the hill it's it's not an option anymore simply put it's not well, an option it's, it's like my slate mate said alexandria cortez she said it, in order for one of us to win a hundred of us have to try Absolutely. and it's true it's true uh we you know she's there we're coming behind her you know 100 percent. and you know one thing that really makes me happy because I think about the numbers and I think, okay, you know, we made significant progress. There were, um, you know, what, six or seven Justice Democrats slash brand new Congress members mm -hmm. elected. Um, and that's not a lot when you look at just it from a numbers perspective. Although 
the impact that they're having, you know, AOC, Ilhan Omar is tremendous. So I think if we simply added a few more members to the squad, if we got another senator like you, who's progressive, the difference that that would make is huge. You know, even if from a quantitative standpoint, it's not ideal qualitatively, it's going to be all the difference. And what will be nice with you running for the Senate is we need more people in the Senate. If Bernie becomes president, that's one senator who's right. very progressive right. that's taken out. Right. So we're left with who? Elizabeth Warren, Jeff mm -hmm. Merkley, and then semi-progressive people like mm -hmm. Sherrod Brown. We need loud people to get in there and say we will be unapologetically progressive and look out for the people. So let me ask you this. Hypothetically speaking, let's imagine the best case scenario where Bernie's elected president, because I want people mm -hmm. to try to imagine, you know, some something that will make them happy because it's difficult. Bernie's elected, you're elected, you're in the Senate, he's president. What mm -hmm. do you think in that first year you'll be able to accomplish, you know, when working with Bernie Sanders in the White House and AOC in the House? What could you imagine would be feasible within that first year? I hope our number one goal is to get is to pass Medicare for all. Um, I think that should be the first thing that we pass. But also our goal is too is to, like we said, hold people accountable. If I'm there in the Senate with Joe Manchin, he's not going to get by with the stuff he did because I'm not going to let him by with it. I'm going to be very vocal. If he's going to represent my state, he's going to represent my state. If he's there with me, he needs to run. We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder. He's not going to get by with voting for Kavanaugh again. He's not going to get by with avoiding Medicare for all. I'm going to be in his face and I'm going to be in everybody's face in the Senate and I'm going to be an actual voice for West Virginia. And I'm just sitting here imagining how wonderful it would be to have you serve in the Senate with Joe Manchin, because that would be so uncomfortable for him. And I know that you wouldn't care, but for him, he has someone who is holding him accountable, who's from West Virginia, because mm -hmm. Capitol's not gonna hold him accountable. You know, they're, they're one and the same, as you said, you know? The they're buddies, is, they're the, buddies. They, right. They have dinner and get on zip lines together. So they're just good old buddies, the good old boy, you know, the dynasty needs to go. West Absolutely. Virginia is tired of it. Absolutely. Dynasty politics has not been good. You know, when you mm -hmm. elect someone who got there because of nepotism or money or privilege, we see the way that that turns out. It, it doesn't work well for normal Americans. So to have normal people get in there, that, that would be a game changer. And I'm really... Like, I try to be cautiously optimistic, but really there is a reason to be positive when you see so many great candidates running. So one thing that I wanted to ask you about, and we talked a little bit about this when you, uh, Cory Bush and Amy Valella came on to talk about the uh, documentary Knock Down the House. Has that helped you at all? Like um, in terms of name recognition, in terms of more people knowing who you are in West Virginia? I think so, yeah. I think the, I think the film helped, but the biggest, the biggest, win of that film is just like what I said, we changed not only the national, but the international narrative. And not only that, but it also created more leaders in this movement and more people stepping up to run for office. We showed it even without, you know, millions of dollars in your campaign's accounts or, you know, we, we I think in the past, we kind of put our, our representatives on a pedestal. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm not polished. I, I don't come from a lot of money. I don't have an extensive college degree. Well, you know, I don't even think that should be the criteria to be a representative anyway. You know, who need, what is the quote? The people in front of the power, you know, front of the pain need to be, be in charge of the power. I don't think I'm quoting it right, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know what it is to balance, what it's like to balance a checkbook. I know what it's like to bury my family in coal mining. I know what it's like to go out every day and struggle. I see the addiction epidemic every day. I see the poverty here every day. I see the water. I see everything. I see that you know our economic structure here is broken. I, you know, I've worked with you know, and a lot of people have across this state have been working in the front line and work front lines and working on our issues because our incumbents have not been serving us. So why not should we be? Why shouldn't we be serving? you know, serving um, our states anyway and being representatives anyway. Well, let's be honest, our incumbents are corporate serving and lobbyist serving. They're never going to serve us. And if we want a country that serves us, no be who, who better to serve us than us? You know, um, I, my campaign slogan, and I come up with it, investing in ourselves, and that's what we do. We're tired of a government that doesn't serve us. We know it doesn't work. We keep, they keep on promising prosperity, we keep on waiting for it, and people continue to die. And that's a realistic, it, that's real for West Virginians. People are dying here at an alarming rate. 
I was at a funeral with a friend yesterday during my campaign. Um, it was addiction, cancer, um, suicide. We have a high suicide rate in the state because, you know, it's, it's all systemic problems. I buried 20 of my family members and friends during my, the last, you know, during my campaign. That, you know, people shouldn't be dying at an alarming rate. And if our incumbents are going to turn a blind eye to that, not only shame on them, but it's going to bring more leaders out like me that's going to fight them even harder because it's not fair. It's not fair that people should live in impoverished conditions comparable to a third world country. People shouldn't be falling like, you know, dropping like flies because of the addiction epidemic. And nobody in America should have to beg for something so basic as a clean glass of water. You know, and people are begging for jobs here, begging for jobs. It's a shame, you know, our, our biggest employer in West Virginia is Walmart. And we can't even sustain Walmart in Boone County. What does that say about our state? And with the gas industry, you know, it, they have to be responsible players if they're going to be here. We're not going to let repeated patterns like the coal industry. They're not going to come in our communities, destroy our water, destroy our land, destroy our health, and not give anything back. You know, they need to be environmentally sound. They need to take care of our communities, give back to our communities, and put the jobs in our communities if they're going to force themselves to be here. Because most of the time, they travel with mo mobile workers with the pipelines, and we don't even see the jobs within our communities. And our leaders let them buy with it. And like I said, they're putting all their eggs back in one basket. They're not visionaries for growth in our future. And we're tired of it. We're tired of them putting all their eggs in their pocketbooks and their, you know, they're big, rich baskets, and everybody here suffers. You know, I, I come from generation after generation after generation after coal miners. I live in a single wide trailer, and I, I mean, I'm proud of it. I'm not ashamed. But what do I have, do I have to show for it except for going to, you know, going to funerals? It's a shame that people here go to more funerals than they do family reunions, and that's a reality for West Virginians. Yeah, and that's so sad. And one thing that you mentioned, it was so poignant. Like, I think that everyone is so sick of this elitist politics like it's believed that in you know before you can run for the senate you have to be a mayor you have to be educated at an ivy league school and we're to this point where people mm -hmm. are realizing no we need right. normal working class people who are in the community like you are in your community so the fact that somebody or we previously thought you know that doesn't make you qualify because you didn't follow these rules it's it's absolutely um, it's a new game now. Like it's mm -hmm. funny how I see you know every once in a while Republicans will dog on AOC because she was a bartender and that's mm -hmm. supposed to be a bad thing. No right. normal people like that that it that is a normal thing because you know these policies they don't affect the Ivy League people. They're going to be fine. These rich elites will be fine. It's mm -hmm. the normal people at the very bottom who are affected. So it only makes mm -hmm. sense that they get in and run. And I'm just so glad that people are, you know, in general, waking up and seeing that. And we're kind of moving away from this elitist mentality in the country. And I think it's because, you know, the number of elites is decreasing because the country is in mm -hmm. such bad shape. So I mm -hmm. think that everyone who uh, is watching this, they already know and love you. But I just really want to make the pitch for you. The website is polygene.com. It's currently under mm -hmm. construction, but there yep. is a donation link. And please, right. even if you can't spare much, a dollar, anything that you can help, is absolutely crucial because Polygene is going you. up against a political machine and unfortunately it can't be done without money it doesn't need to be the same amount of money but certainly she's got to have money for staff to get the word out you know to canvas to create campaign um, uh, materials and whatnot so please donate and Paula before we go do you want to just make one last pitch because you've already won over like basically 100% of my audience so anything that you can um, add and want to say well, one thing I want to say, if people are thinking about running for office and they're always worried about, oh, my gosh, what if this comes out? Oh, you know, or that comes out on me. Or, you know, everybody's worried. Oh, I have a past. Everybody has a past. Wear your scars like a badge. Think about your goals and think about being a true representative. All of our representatives have a past. They just have a lot of money to cover up their past. You know, the media doesn't cover their past. Don't worry about scrutiny. Keep your eyes on the prize and wear your scars like a badge. And don't worry about all that stuff. If you feel like you can represent your community or your state, step up and do it because there's a lot of people now. We learned a lot of, you know, we made a lot of mistakes last time, but we learned a lot of lessons. We gained a lot of education being grassroots candidates. Um, 
anybody can reach out to brand new Congress. They can reach out to myself. There's there's leaders all over the country that's willing to help somebody that wants to step up and run for office. And thank you for saying that. And thank you for running not once but twice, because the amount of like just personal sacrifice, you know, and dedication that goes into you doing this again. It's tremendous, and I, I don't want to take that for granted, and I don't want others to take that for granted. So thank you so much, because you're fighting for West yeah. Virginia, but this is something that affects all of us. So thank you so much. It Paula does. Jean, 2020. Uh, we're all rooting for you, and of course, you know, uh, we'll be glad to have you back anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I love you so you guys. much, Paula. We love Bye. you, too.